in the lab, you will use the equation that we'll, we'll talk about here for diffraction gratings. And you do some, uh, some experiments to verify the, the things that we've talked about here today. A diffraction grating is where you have multiple slits. Instead of just two, you have three, four, five, six, seven, uh, or tens of thousands of slits. Um, an arrangement consisting of a large number of closely spaced parallel slits is called a diffraction grating. And you'll use one in the lab. It looks like just a piece of glass, but actually etched into the glass at a tiny, tiny fraction of an inch, well, is about 10,000 lines per inch, uh, roughly, in that diffraction grating that you'll use to look at the spectra from different objects. So you've got uh, light coming in, this blue here. We've got several slits. In this diagram, we've got one, two, three, four, five slits. But you can have tens of thousands of slits in various diffraction gratings. The curious thing about diffraction gratings is that there's really nothing new. Well, there's a little bit new, but mostly old. So as Felix Bloch's one, Bloch once said, the Nobel Prize laureate at Stanford University, never underestimate the joy that people get in hearing something they already know. So I'm going to tell you something you already know. We still get a central maximum. We get a uh, first order maximum. So we're back now thinking not about diffraction so much as interference, two slit interference. So, so I'd like to get your brains back on that. Um, well, if we just look at two slits, then we know where the maxima and the minima, minima are. And in fact, the minima or the maxima are ex in exactly the same places as they were for two-slit interference. The bright fringes produced by diffraction grating are in the same places. So sometimes uh, in the lab, I believe the word maxima are used instead of bright fringes. Why do we call it maxima? We think of uh, maximum light intensity. So that'd be a maximum, this would be a maximum. And maxima is plural for maximum. But the bright fringes in a direction grating turn out to be in the same places as, but are narrow than, narrower than those produced by a double slit. So we're back to the uh, constructive interference, bright fringes, sine theta is m lambda over d. This is exactly the same as we saw for two slit interference. But this is bright fringes on a distant screen for a diffraction grating with a slit separation D. So this is the distance between those two, between the slits. So here's a, now instead of being the slit width, this is a distance center to center. I'm trying to make that centered. Center to center between the slits, slit, slit separation. And um, that's where the maxima are. This is for a double slit, two slit. We got a uh, maximum, we got a minimum. So this is a bright fringe, this is a dark fringe, bright fringe, dark fringe, et cetera. What do we get for a diffraction grating with five slits in it? Turns out the maxima, the bright fringes, are in the same places as they were for the two slit. One, two, three, four, um, five of those. M equals one, M equals two. The angles are all the same. That's, that's given by this equation. It's the same as it is for two slit. But the minima, the dark fringes, it's more complicated. Here you get a, uh, for the double slit, you just get a single dark fringe right here in the middle, halfway between the two bright fringes. What do you get here? For five slits, you get a bunch of dark. Uh, you get four of them spaced in there. And, and some little maxima as well. And if you go to 10 slits, so you get even more of these little bumps inside here. The peaks get more narrow. These peaks will get narrow. And you'll see this in the lab. Peaks get more narrow, but the peaks are located in the same places. 
So that's why in this one, we haven't put down what, what we get for destructive interference because it's more complicated and it hardly matters because most of the light is concentrated here at these peaks. Uh, an example, a mixture of violet light and red light falls onto a grating uh, with 1 times 10 to the 4 lines per centimeter. So this is 10 to the 3 is, th is 1,000. This is 10 to the 4. This is 10,000 lines per centimeter. So we can actually find the, um, the separation between the lines from this number of lines per centimeter. If there's uh, 10,000 lines per centimeter, then what's the number of centimeters per line? Well, the number of centimeters per line is the slit separation. So that will be 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. So all you have to do is take that number and put it on its head, take 1 over that number, and you get the separation. 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, we need to convert, we'll need an answer in meters, so we need 100 centimeters per meter conversion factor. We're going to divide 10 to the minus 4 by 100. That gives 10 to the minus 6 meters. And that's this number that we've got in the denominator here for V, or for D. Violet light, 410 um, nanometers. And that'll give us a 24 degree separation for the first order maximum. We put in m equals 1. This, this equation comes from sine theta equals m lambda over d it's on the last slide. First order maximum means m equals 1. So all we need is sine theta is lambda over d. And we take the inverse sine of both sides to get theta equals inverse sine of lambda over d. So that's what we have right here. So what do we found? With violet light, this first order maximum comes at an angle of 24 degrees. Our first order, uh, yeah, first order maximum. So here's the zero point, and violet has its m equals 1 first order maximum at an angle at 24 degrees. But red light with its longer wavelength. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the wavelength, go from violet to red. I got a bigger wavelength. We'll get a bigger angle, like we talked about before. And that bigger angle is 41 degrees. So like we talked about before, the red is spread further than the violet is. Lots of applications of interference and diffraction. The, the pits in your CD uh, compact disks, they're actually not pits, but they're raised regions on the bottom of your CD. And the laser bounces off of these raised regions in the, in the CD. They, the manufacturers use a, a, the height of these so-called pits. They look like pits because when you look um, from the top of the CD, the pits look like a, a lake. It's deeper down. And uh, whereas from the bottom side, they look like raised regions. And uh, all of this is covered with, with a coat of clear plastic anyway. So this thickness is chosen in such a way to reduce interference when these pits pass through the, the laser beam that's incident on the bottom side of the disk. And also, uh, a diffraction grating is sometimes used for, for help with tracking. You put laser light through a diffraction grating, like we talked about, 
there'd be a central maximum and then uh, first order maximum that are used for a tracking beam. And if the reflected light from this, this first order maximum that's supposed to be hitting on not in the pits but in the region between the pits, the landing so called, then uh, if this one has a different intensity than that one, then you know that the laser beam is, is a little bit off. That this one maybe is going into the next pit over, for example, and that's how a tracking mechanism is used.